is the Mindset Athlete Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. I'm a two-time Paralympian and owner of James Robert Fitness, which is an online training, nutrition, and mindset coaching business. First of all, I'd like to thank Lauren Williams for suggesting this quote to the show. An athlete is a mindset. It's how you prepare, think, and execute. Not because of some elite status or physical stature. Anybody can be an athlete. By Chris Hart. And each week on the Mindset Athlete, we like to bring you inspirational athletes, a message, or experts talking about human optimization to teach you how to change your perception of your mindset and become 1% better. And on today's show, I've got Tina Hurley. Tina is a 35-year-old former gymnast, Division I competition cheerleader, exercise physiologist, and national certified physician assistant who became an amputee in 2016. She lost a leg after 10 surgeries failed to restore blood flow to a leg from a rare vascular condition called I'm going to get this wrong. I'm going to I'm going to cheat. P A P A E S. She needed two revision amputations the following year due to wound healing challenges from impaired blood flow. In 2018, just a few months from the last free amputation, she made a name for herself in the adaptive community, winning second place at the international attended CrossFit competition in Miami called Wadapalooza. Training with the U.S. Paralympic bobsleigh team in Europe, training with the U.S. cycling program in Colorado Springs, attending the Adaptive Training Foundation in Texas and winning the CrossFit Adaptive Games in Canada. She began teaching adaptive fitness and became a disability advocate as well as mentoring those with permanent physical impairments. In 2018, Tina founded the 501C charity Less Leg more heart to further support the disability community using her unique knowledge as both a medical professional and patient identifying areas of need in this social in this special population and executing strategic partnerships with companies of similar similar philanthropic core values this non-profit provides peer mentorship medical advocacy funding for holistic approaches to care and funding for home services needed during transition they engage local communities and business to rally alongside families with disabilities in distress to create stabilized socio-economic circumstances and spread the joy and giving with the core belief that is we rise by lifting others up so welcome onto the show tina thank you for having me oh the pleasure is all mine uh obviously we will go straight in at the deep end And I will let you pronounce the condition that you got. Yeah, so you're right. P-A-E-S. It's popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. And so it's, uh, the name is inherent. um, It sort of tells you where it is and what it does. So popliteal is behind the knees. And entrapment meaning that the vessels that bring oxygen-rich blood into and out of the leg are trapped when the calf is engaged. So what caused that? They think it's congenital, the way that you're born. It's pretty rare and understudied, but uh, the working theory is that it's an in utero development. So when your limbs grow uh, in the womb, they kind of twist and extend like you'd see a tree form. And with that has to come pretty specific placement of all of the structures. And in this situation, I think that it's just a little bit off. So what your background within gymnastics and cheerleading have made that situation worse then with the impacts yeah anything that creates hypertrophy will in theory make the problem bigger right the entrapment bigger and there's there's six different types the first four are anatomic so they're studied in literature to be like the medial gastroc the you know one of the heads of the calf muscle And then there's, you know, three other types based on what the actual impingement thing is. And then the last two are functional, meaning the recruitment, you know, of of that contraction pattern with multiple structures creates the issue. But regardless, there is muscle involved. And so, you know, the more atrophic and small the muscle is, then the less, in theory, power and space it would occupy in the leg. 
so yeah, uh, being a power athlete um, and somebody that did a lot of calf raises and gymnastics and CrossFit and like you said, pouncing and plyometrics, it certainly wasn't the most ideal uh, activity to have participated in with that condition. But hindsight's twenty twenty, huh? Mm-hmm. Obviously, we do being a physiologist now, Tina, and we go into a little bit of, I'm going to try and keep it as a layman as, as possible for the listeners. Would that condition be more problematic for somebody who, who's congenital as well? Because obviously, you, and I'm going to talk from personal experience, because of somebody that had not small man syndrome, but I will use it using the disability to be the crutch in some way, obviously, are you going to make some allowances to over stimulate that muscle on the good side? And then obviously poss- possibly then cause something similar to that. Are you, are you meaning a congenital amputee? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. I mean, I, I know some folks that they, they do that, right. They, they overtrain, the one side that's sort of compensating and, you know, there's good reason for it aside from aesthetic reasons, but it's just, it's got to take more weight. You know, I mean, think about how many one leg squats we do every day, you know, off the bathroom or the couch or, you know, uh, there's a lot of folks that don't put even weight even still in, in both of their limbs, the prosthetic and the sound side. So I get overtraining um, would happen. And just honestly, recovery in and of itself for an acquired amputee rather than congenital all of the extra strain that goes on and some of the setbacks with either population and how much extra the other leg has to do again any stimulus is going to create more muscle in that dominant side and if you have the disease in both of the legs which is common and what i have then it will accelerate the condition is, do you think there needs to be further research into obviously the you know the the hypertrophy of the sound leg because ultimately well I'll give some that is I've never actually told this but but outside of my family or to even to clients obviously I'm a, I'm quite a naughty boy when it comes to hopping to go to the bathroom at night and obviously you're told as an amputee you must use your crutches. And people have asked me, well, why don't you? It's like, well, because I don't want to wake completely wake up from, from my slumber and ultimately be quicker to hop there and back than it would be to, you know, try and scramble around and look for my crutches. I probably will sub- subdue and take on advice, but I think it's that stubbornness of the athlete and, and, and I think I know better. Yeah, so I don't have a sound side, and hopping is pretty, uh, you know, it's stimulating for the symptoms and also progressing of the disease because I've only had surgeries on my amputate, now amputated limb, which obviously didn't work or it wouldn't be amputated, and the other side is still a problem. So really it's just trying to avoid stuff that will cause symptoms because the symptoms then create thickening of the artery and the artery then closes off and then the same fate is produced. So I'm actually more of a throw my leg on to use the bathroom or use the wheelchair just so I don't hop. Um, but uh, I can respect a hop. Well, it's pro- it probably goes back for years and years of, well, that was the sports first sport I did was swimming. But then I, I was very, you could call it proactive with the coach and say, well, instead of me getting out of the pool and going around the outside to then go again, and that's caused me more fatigue uh, when it comes to actually doing the sprint, can I not just swim back and do it in a leisurely manner? And ultimately they agreed, but it took me to becoming a teenager to do that. But it probably was not proactive at that particular moment in time. That was probably me being a little bit lazy. Mm. But going back to your early days now, Tina, to being a gymnast and obviously then going to go to college with your cheerleading, why do you think that cheerleading obviously gets a bad rap from just being on the sidelines of, you know, from a movie perspective now, be it either a football game or a basketball game, when it is in itself, if you were to YouTube it, 
it's it's a sport in itself yeah i think there's two separate types of cheerleading there's as you mentioned sideline cheer which is more of the historic um pep rally supporting and it's the only sport that really does have its mission to support another team by way of crowd participation and hype that's really specific to cheerleading it's not no other sport does that so i think the fact that it's an entity that is not supporting of itself as the primary goal is in my opinion not the athletic um team sport that like i participated in which was you know, division one cheerleading and competition cheer travel team cheerleading, which was, and is what you see if you Google Top Gun and California All-Stars and, you know, some of these big name, uh, you know, co-ed or all girl, large team stunt throwing impressive tumbling pass, you know, two and a half minute routines that are just, I mean, choreography wise, incredible, uh, just talent wise, it's just next level what they're doing every year, uh, just pushing the envelope with like death defying stunts um, and having participated for a long time in the competitive side of cheerleading, that is 100% of sport. And so, but I could see how someone not involved in the community of cheer without understanding the difference between like historical cheerleading and the requirement, truly the requirement of schools and universities is that the cheer teams do maintain at least a strong component of what that heritage is in order for it to maintain its entity. And so it's created issues in some universities being designated as true athletic sports because you either have like a cheer squad and a competition team, which are separate things, or you have one that has to actually fulfill both criteria of going to X number of games, supporting, you know, the the four different sports that they say you need to in order to be able to continue their competition team. I mean, it's, it's actually pretty challenging. So like for myself, for Division One at University of New Hampshire, in order for us to do the things we wanted to do, be listed as athletic sports and go to Daytona Nationals, which is the big event for college cheerleading, we had to cheer for not just football and not just basketball, but actually volleyball. And um, you just stand on the sidelines and you, your hands are on your hips. And every time think about a volleyball match, every time the ball like goes in a good direction and you score, you had to go like point U and H. Yeah. Like being someone that can jump in the air and do a full twisting backflip before my feet hit the floor again or do you know three jumps hitting my toes and then and then that move or throw a girl in the air where she does a backflip with two twists before she lands like just having the athletic skill to do impressive feats being reduced to like an overclap you know uh it's just so you have to take the good and the bad and um it's a challenge for a lot of competition minded uh, individuals, but there are people that actually really enjoy cheerleading as the sideline activity. I'll say, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of validity to having, you know, cheer squads at games. I think that the ambiance that it sets, the crowd energy that it, you know, displays the entertainment factor of dancing and stunting and tumbling, you know, while the crowd is there serves a purpose. Um, do I think it needs to be in really short, you know, skirts and uh, full makeup if they're looking to be called athletes, you know, I would challenge that concept. But um, again, that's, that's like a historical thing. And as you know, we're so far behind times with like the traditions that we do and the why behind what we do that um, I was always in the bucket of supporting the competition cheer because they're moving toward Capri pants and they're moving toward, you know, it's just, you're wearing these like outfits that speak to the athleticism of what you're doing and not toward the eye appeal of what you're doing. And that's kind of what matters. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question completely, but I, I see why people misunderstand and why they don't have a ton of respect for sideline cheer um, from an athletic perspective. Uh, it's more of an entertainment perspective. And if you're looking to get excited about the competition piece, Netflix actually did a really cool documentary called cheer 
that highlights a lot of the competition um, and a lot of the work that goes behind competition cheerleading, they did a great job. And it, that's kind of more real life cheerleading as it's been the last decade uh, than what we're historically seeing with megaphones and all of that, which is kind of uh, tradition. It's just tradition. So let me ask you this then, Tina. I'm going to come at it from two different points and let you answer them individually. We come back to your story about the volleyball. How do you motivate yourself to do that? Because ultimately that's in one sense quite degrading as, a, so, as an athlete. And you're wearing midriff tops, and, you know, and it's, it, it is. I think it's degrading, for, you know, but you have, just like life, there are things that you have to do to ensure that you have the opportunity to get to do the things you want to do. And so there wasn't an option in my program to not do sideline cheer for the sports and still be on the competition team. In fact, if you missed a number of games, you were pulled from roster. So it's an administrative criteria that has to be met. It's like you can't participate in your sport at school if you don't go to class. You know, so it's really a systems issue. It, it's is what it is. Um, and yeah, no, it was it was my least favorite part. Um, and then talk about safety. So you want us to throw tumbling passes down a gym floor where people are sweating and it's slippery and there's no padding, um, you know, as opposed to the styrofoam or the you know, spring floors that are actually safe for our joints and muscles and what we train on. So, I mean, it's just, there's so many levels of dysfunction based on um, tradition and, and like what we're used to doing that don't make sense. And I think the degrading piece was something you kind of just learned to swallow um, which is sad to say, but, you know, again, all I can say is it's a sacrifice like many people make in many different ways to be able to get to what your goal is. And in, in that case, my goal is to make Matt, to compete in the big venues, to throw the cool stunts, to throw the good tumbling passes. And so you're willing to do whatever you need to, to make that happen. And then if we move it to now 2020 with dealing with COVID, do you think those squads are going to be more of have more influence when collegiate sports goes back? I'm not sure. You know, I have no idea how that's going to impact specifically cheerleading. I can't imagine. I mean, as long as the events are going to go back to being live, right. The venues are going to be filled and there's people going to, that are going to be in the crowd. And um, I can't imagine that the virus aside from crowd control and, you know, precautions because of gatherings, will affect the like core structure of the way cheerleading programs are designed in the U S I just, I think that's a bit of a stretch. It would be great. That would be a wonderful perk, but I, I don't think we're there yet, which is unfortunate. Do you think that would be the next hurdle that the NCA NCAA needs to obviously overcome after, you know, the likeness of the players? I think, I think, Cheer specifically is just low on the totem pole with things to fix. I think we've got way bigger fish to fry than being worried about the girls with pom poms and their skirts because most of them are pretty happy. <laughs> so, so moving nicely then. Uh, obviously, we don't want to cause too much controversy. <laughs> What was the transition like from going from obviously gymnastics to then cheerleading to then going doing CrossFit? You know, it, it was necessary for me to move out of gymnastics. I started at a really young age and it was the only sport my mom was able to get me into where I actually took naps. Like I was actually tired. You know, I, I did karate and just, it was too much quiet. And so I stopped as a white belt and then she tried me in soccer and there was just a lot of running and it turned out I was not very aerobic. Um, and then she got me in gymnastics and it was so much stimulus and so much aerobic and just tuckered me out and I loved it. So we, she kept me in that just for logistics, really raising three children, having one of them just be able to sleep was helpful to her. Uh, and I loved it until my body, you know, started changing in my teenage years and your centrifugal force is totally different. Like you're really working with a totally different construct if you are still working toward elite gymnastics as you transition through your maturity, because it just, it, it tailor, it changes a lot of um, the mechanics. And so I was 
just peeling off the bars. I was eating it on beam, just so many scars down my shins and it just wasn't as enjoyable. And I think I would have stuck with it if I was a higher level. Like if I was going to make Olympics or if I was going to make national team or if I was just like a bracket or two above where I was able to have gotten at that point in my life, then it might've been worth the sacrifice and the multiple hours of training in the gym and the leaving school early and the, all these things that happen when you're in a really competitive gymnastics program. But when at that age, you know, like, like 14, 15, if you really haven't made it to that level, it's unlikely that you're going to, you know? Uh, and so I had to make a decision to kind of pull back and I did prep up for a few years, which was I get to choose two events instead of all four events. And I did um, floor and uh, vault because it was a lot more power, a lot less refined. You know, I had a little margin of error, which was nice for me and loved it. And then the cheerleading teams, so this was like in middle school, the cheer teams, you know, were starting to look because they, I could tumble and I was now around. I wasn't, you know, leaving school early and, you know, social things became more intriguing. And um, so then they were like, Oh, you know, we, we practice three days a week and it's only an hour and, you know, you can tumble and that's wonderful. And, you know, a lot of the cheerleaders, at least where in my hometown, you know, it, this is in like 2000 and this is like late nineties the sports evolved so much since then, but there really weren't a lot of people that could tumble well because they all did gymnastics. So uh, the cheerleaders didn't have that feature. So I jumped on the cheer team and all of a sudden you're, you know, you're accepted on a silver platter because you have these skills no one else has. And so it was, it was kind of fun to go from, you know, your average advanced gymnast where, Romanian coaches always told you you weren't good enough and your toes weren't pointed enough and your lines weren't straight enough. And you had 700, you know, V ups to do because you talked like one time in practice to having this social circle and being kind of idolized a little bit for this cool skill set and, um, and having it be relaxed and there wasn't as much conditioning. And, um, so it was fun. It was, it, I ended up being something that I enjoyed, um, doing. And then when I got into high school, it became a bit more competitive and, you know, we won uh, our state uh, championship and, you know, I was exposed to co-ed cheerleading and, um, and then division one at, at the university of New Hampshire, which was all girl at this point, but segued into doing competition teams and really saw the athleticism um, and was able to express a lot of those skills I'd learned in gymnastics and heighten my level of skill through those programs as well until I severed my ACL and, uh, you know, had multiple knee surgeries and had to kind of hang my jersey up uh, in my mid twenties. But you know, going from that background in gymnastics and like the, there's just a level of proprioception and body awareness that's created in gymnastics that a lot of sports you don't get. That um, I don't think you you get. I mean, to be able to tumble and you know your body to be flying through space with four different appendages in these complex, you know, sequences, it just requires a lot of hand-eye coordination, a lot of like rapid movement, um, and a lot of like analysis of your body in space, which I think can translate to a lot of different sport success. So um, specifically CrossFit, there's, you know, gymnasts really do have a great basis um, of athletic movement. um, And most of it's just body awareness, because when you're aware of your body more than other sports, you can tailor, tweak, refine, work your weaknesses a lot easier because you just kind of get what you're doing wrong. If someone explains it, if there's not this like hard wall between what you're hearing a coach say, and then what you need to do, because you've already felt it, you you know, you're more aware. So going from that into CrossFit was a really good transition and um, set the stage for some of the successes that I had, which, um, you know, if I I were to have any regrets about the diagnosis timeline, I wish that it had held out for just a couple more years because I was on track to, to have gone, I think far, um, you know, in my new CrossFit journey in like the 2010s, had I had more time to be able to put into some of the Olympic lifting and the training, um, because a lot of the people I was training with went to regionals and even further, and I know that I could have done that. It's just, it got kind of taken away, um, 
just as it was starting to get exciting. Do you think that's why you jumped at the prospect with all the, the, the adaptive stuff that you've done? Um, can you say that? What, what do you mean? Do you think because you kind of had your, your, your careers stopped prematurely multiple times, is that, is that why you jumped at the chance with the, the adaptive stuff? No, I think it was more self preservation. So when my leg was lost, I, I lost a number of years of my identity, my physicality, because both of those were kind of tied together. And, you know, my body was not trained, you know, I, I had so many surgeries and so much medication and so much limitation that I really was not conditioned at all. And it was the first time in my life. So I just, and all the things that happened mentally about that, like how you feel about yourself and your, your vitality and your energy and um, just your life force, you know, everything was just dull. And when my husband left me after my amputation, I needed community and physicality back in my life. I've always been a people person, a sports team player, um, CrossFit's community aspect, the just the people. I missed the community. And so I just happened to throw myself into the charitable arms of a local CrossFit gym and said, I just, I need you guys right now to show up in my life and I'll just keep showing up just because I need to move. And it was truly for, I think, preservation mental preservation was the initial reason that I got into the CrossFit gym again. And I had to do it adaptive because there wasn't a way to not do it adaptive. And we didn't even know what that meant as a physiologist and a medical clinician. This is uncharted territory. I had no idea about some of the organizations that are out there right now. I had no idea about the adaptive community. I was the only one like me in my area. So even though all these things existed, I didn't know how to find all of them. And um, so we kind of just, they tried to figure it out, guess and check. And, you know, you work on things and kneeling exercises and learn to walk truly at my CrossFit gym. I have a video of me and one of the trainers and some people in the class as I staggered for my first few steps because it wasn't in a physical therapist office because I hadn't been connected for my prosthetist. So they were so involved in my journey from recovery of my body and my mind to progression of my physicality and walking that um, that's kind of, I think, why I took – I took up that, that path so readily. Uh, and then it turned into, as anybody would that has a competitive background, all right, what can I do next? So I've made it this far. My mind's feeling better. My psyche's feeling better. My body's more conditioned. Um, what's the next goal? Like, I'm not going to stay at this area on the ladder and admire my view too long. I, like, I need to climb because that's the mindset of every athlete, right? So it was just, what's the next rung? What's the next rung by way of just the way that we are bred, I think, when people go into competitive sport. And um, I'm thankful for it. And you talked about, you know, your issues with, with uh, body image and obviously a certain extent, and I appreciate your vulnerability when, when you talk about that, Tina. Do you, do you think it took you hitting rock bottom to see what was physically possible obviously looking up from the canvas and then obviously once you get up off there why did I have to be down there to do something about it yeah I I think that unless you can be uninhibited in your view of yourself and sometimes that's through fear because you have no idea what the options are you can't really tap into all of the possibilities. That's why you hear time after time, people that are, you know, drug addicts that literally hit their rock bottom, like come out and make this amazing Phoenix transformation and do all this good in the world. Or like myself and going through the things I went through and then coming out and doing these, you know, exercise things. And then you you create this nonprofit or, I mean, there's so many people I know. I am just a tiny little specimen of a much greater Um, population of people that have found what their calling is, you know, what their purpose is. And that is first self-fulfillment and recharging your battery. And then it's legacy. It's what do you, what are you leaving behind? But it is sad that a lot of that stimulus is when there's no other direction to go, but inward, everything else is shut off because your options have been 
closed or your your path has been stopped or your you know whatever it is that's the life changing circumstance it I think creates a tunnel vision directly into yourself which people are too busy to go into we're so busy planning and um, moving and staying busy that the productivity aspect of truly like getting to know ourselves and what we're capable of and what sets our soul on fire and what's going to fan those flames. And, um, you know, is this enough what I'm doing for myself and the world gets shut off because it's, you're just too busy for that. You know, you're, you're, (laughs) so it's, um, it's a blessing in disguise in a lot of ways, but it's uh, sad because when you've been through this process, you can see it in other people. You can see that other people aren't tapping into like their, their true potential or they're not thinking big enough or they're complacent or they're, um, they're just comfortable, but you know, they don't want to be, you know, if you're comfortable and complacent and you're happy there, I'm not going to knock that for somebody, but if they're not, and they just can't see that they are stuck, it's sad to think that they're going to have to have a life altering situation occur for them to shed off that dead skin and show their bright colors. You know, it's almost like a, a smoker, you know, it's like, do you have to have the heart attack to stop? (laughs) You know, I mean, there's a lot of people that until that worst case scenario occurs, won't change habit just because of the, the fear of the uncertain. Well, if the fear of the actual current life is greater than the fear of the uncertain, people are much more willing to go into that bubble. Well, you've seen that with with COVID and, and, and exercise. Once we've gone back to normality, people have obviously rooted back to what they were doing before. Some, obviously, I can attest to that that haven't done. That's why I can I can give kudos where it's due uh, that they've seen the benefit in the daily exercise. And I quite like this. I'm going to keep doing it. Obviously, others have seen well. It filled a stop gap to get me out the house. Nah, I don't like this. I'm going to go back to what comfortable feels like. And ultimately, like you said, uh, Tina, you can't change a person that doesn't want to change. So let me ask you this question then. Be you, be, I can't speak, be it you were a person that had never seen an adaptive person before. Do you think the bigger brands within athletics need to do more? Within, especially because of most of, most of those are American companies, to make it more visible. And I talked about this just this week, where I think the Americans, as a program within Paralympic sport, underdeliver under deliver as a nation because of the size of it, it should do a lot better than it does uh, within Paralympic sport. But do you think the likes of, and this is a knock at all of them now, um, and be it Nike, Under Armour, need to be a little bit more proactive with their marketing and actually showcase. And if whoever does it first will probably make a killing um, because I, I did have a go on one of the Under Armour marketing people. was like, well, you're missing a mark here. And whoever does it first can play more on emotion because I think an adaptive person is more relatable to a real per Use the word real person, the normal average person in the street than say an Olympian. Yeah, I just, I think that highlighting the lack of perfection is, as you mentioned, more relatable to everybody. Just, you know, if I am going to be more inclined as a general consumer with a sixth grade education and, you know, being overweight, because that's the the common population, to gravitate towards something that is imperfect than something that I feel like I can't relate to at all, which is this like perfect model and the size two and the all the limbs and, you know, all of, so I I understand your, your comment. Um, I think we're moving in the right direction. You know, Nike has in its stores displayed um, blade running like amputee blades in their um, display windows. Um, There are ads now in Tommy Hilfiger has an adaptive clothing line. You know, I mean, I could just go on and on there. There are a lot of uh, mainstream companies now, international companies that are recognizing the utility of having diversity, but it's just starting, you know, I mean, we're going back to, you know, they used to hide people that were disabled, 
you know, back in the day, and by back in the day, I don't mean very much further than in the last hundred years, people were shunned for being different. People were shunned for having genetic or chromosomal disorders, and they were thought to be inferior. And, um, you know, with that stigma came, you know, families wanting to maintain their statuses and just hide stuff. And so that's where the whole society concept of people being different and broken as being a synonymous theme where that was all founded. So, you know, now we are living in a much different time and um, equality has been a focus and some of the other missions in life like LGBTQ communities and their struggle for equality and pushing fairness and love over like law uh, has translated into a lot of, I think, other demographics, you know, a lot of besides just cultural or just uh, gender and um, sex based is is disability based. It's like let's have a love for everything that is not, you know, the same looking because there is value to diversity. So I, I think companies are moving in that direction. I've seen a lot in just having the nonprofit for the last two years and looking for sources and pushing sources on social media and now following a lot of adaptive groups that also do the same in highlighting companies that have taken to this progressive way of thinking, which hopefully will become the standard of thinking that is unless, you know, if you, if you feel the need to have an Asian or a a black or a, a redhead or a female or whatever your inclusion checkbox needs to be in your corporate office, then there needs to be someone that represents a physical disability because I mean, just Barbie has even done it. Right. So Barbie's got amputees and a wheelchair. So, I mean, it, I think it's becoming more mainstream. I think that the movement has gained traction and I think the continued advocacy of organizations and individuals and the nonprofit sector pushing the envelope and showcasing the abilities over the inabilities is going to continue to help push this forward. Do you think that echoes your, what your core belief uh, of of your nonprofit is we rise by lifting others up. Do you think by the adaptive community as a whole, obviously showcasing itself on social media and showing what is, I wouldn't seem to say physically capable because ultimately you you limit yourself by your own. How would I describe this? Your own mindset. Because one of my teammates from uh, obviously my volleyball days. CrossFit has done a uh, promotional video all about his story going from being um, a police officer in Barbados to coming over here and becoming going into the Grenadier Guards and then obviously being blown up in Afghanistan to going into sports uh, to being ties nicely to your story to going into doing bobsleigh. He asked me. I thought, no chance. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to fr- throw myself down a, a speed tunnel uh, at I don't know, thirty, forty, fifty miles per hour, uh, depending on how how much velocity it picks up. Well, but that's yeah. prob- but that's probably because of um, you know me as a kid watching Cool Runnings and thinking of the story where he shows the guys the crashes. I probably think of that. No. Nope. I want to be doing that, or I think one of my, the captain of the volleyball team has gone into skeleton, which I think is more even more crazy to go on a dinner tray and and go head first down the ice. Uh, but then coming back to his story about the CrossFit, and you talked about the mindset. It obviously it was an he's got an able bodied coach pushing. Well, why can't you do that? And that is the first person I have ever heard from an able bodied perspective to question somebody that's adaptive normally it's the other way around yeah it's so um scary for people that are not familiar with anyone adaptive is to approach that person with tough love or the normal conversation you'd have with any athlete that's creating excuses for their perceived limits that we know are all just perception Um, it's this coddling, it's this kid glove situation where we think we're doing people a benefit by buffering them from strained conversation or prodding them too hard because they've been through enough and, oh, this poor thing. And just let's let them 
you know, navigate it and what they're comfortable with that should be enough. It's all these ways of thinking that are enabling excuses. And it, it stems back again to a misperception of what it means to be disabled. What it means to be disabled is not that we are all laying on couches, hopped up on antidepressants and, and can't do things like grocery shopping. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that we are running a spectrum of human characteristics, just like able-bodied folks, where some of us are lazy. And some of us are, you know, like our medication too much. And some of us are just extremely proficient at excelling. Um, you know, we, we as a collective group, just like Able Bodies as a collective group, are not exactly the same, all of us. And so just because someone might have run into a diabetic elderly patient at a nursing home that didn't have a leg, and that's their only basis for comparison, doesn't mean that every amputee that they meet has the same mindset as that person that's bed bound. And so it's just recognizing that, you know, having five less toes or having an inactive spinal cord or having had a stroke or whatever it is, is one defining feature of that person that as an entity has much more characteristic to them that makes them independent than just their disability. And so if you define and you just clump and you bucket everybody with the same diagnosis and treat them all the same, and you expect that that's going to create some good outcome and you're going to enable that individual to find that special part of them and progress them and inspire them and motivate them, especially talking from a coaching perspective. I mean, that's kind of, that's madness, right? It's, it doesn't make any conceptual sense, but because it's a sensitive topic, and because people don't understand the the way to approach people with you know special needs, they default to what is the most politically correct. And the most politically correct right now in society is just be nice and don't challenge and you know just give give sympathy. And it's great that we're starting to see that challenge now, like in that example that you demonstrated, because. Um, treating people broken is going to create a situation where they perpetually feel broken and they act broken. And now it's a self-fulfilling prophecy for that stereotype rather than, Hey, can I hold the door for you? Able body says to a person that has a disability, person with disability says, Oh, I got it. Rather than the person walking away or still holding the door, which is even worse. Maybe they say something like, I know you do. It's probably just easier for you. Huh? Like empowerment, right? So empowerment by way of tough love and motivational coaching, like this person demonstrated, as you mentioned, is such a great way of approaching the adaptive community instead of just um, this complacency condoning that we see. I probably the other way because this happened a few weeks ago or, or m- m- maybe pushing out a few months ago uh, when we were in one of our national parks here. And somebody asked me, oh, do you want to help on helping down? No, I got, I've got this, but th- that comes to probably the other point you were gonna, you were gonna make, Tina. Was my stubbornness to not be willing to help, have a helping hand, but also in fairness to them, obviously we're living in a pandemic, so I don't want you to come near me because I don't know where you come from. Well, so. you, know, you bring up a good point, um, and I've had to learn this the hard way. Is there is tremendous strength in vulnerability. But there's also a missed capture of connection that can occur between two people when one is seeking to help and one is not seeking anything, but has the opportunity to be helped, whether or not they need it. So I used to do this too, right? Because I'm stubborn as well, and most successful people are, that I would like get frustrated. I don't need help. Do you want me to help you? (laughs) And um what I recognize is sometimes you deprive people the goodness of giving or the um, maybe it, we deter others from engaging and asking others if they want help because we may have come off like a prickly pear, which I know I've done. Um, so in my, I call it more wise amputee, like in the last year or two, I have realized that um, sometimes I know I don't need help, but 
if someone's going to feel good because they give me a hand, like you said, non-COVID, we're talking, we're talking no virus, um, or someone's going to, you know, feel like their life um, is brightened because they did their good deed for the day, um, you know, or it gives me the opportunity to stand alongside them while they quote unquote help or do something. And I get to ask them a question or, you know, relate to them or learn something about them or make them laugh or smile. It's just that connection and that opportunity in that moment that is important now for me. And so like, for instance, I was just at the grocery store two days ago and I can't stand or walk for very long. Um, I look like a normal baloney amputee and um, have even been criticized in some venues uh, by undereducated folks uh, that, you know, at like, for instance, Spartan, like I use a wheelchair for distance, but I can get out and do certain obstacles because I have a few minutes I can use my leg and I have to get off of it, um, which if you knew my disease, you'd understand, but people don't really do the research when they're um, out to judge, right? So uh, there's been some challenges there, but, you know, in speaking to that, it's important because I can't get around a grocery store in one fell swoop. Um, I just, my legs won't, it doesn't work that way. I don't have oxygen getting to my tissues. So um, I use a cart usually if it's not a quick trip. And I was using a cart and I'm going out to my car and, you know, I just, I can stand easily and get all my bags in and get them up to my apartment. It's just, I have to take breaks and I have to use the cart. So this gentleman, you know, was there with his wife and they were walking out and he just jumped as soon as I got my groceries into my car. He goes, let me take that back inside for you. And I mean, I'm parked at this point in the handicapped spot. I'm very close to the front of the door. I don't need him to take that card inside for me, but he looked so interested in helping. And he, he looked like all of his intentions were pure and it just was going to make him feel so good to just do something to give back in any way he can that I said, okay, that'd be great. You know, I asked his name and what do you do? You live around here. We had a mutual contact. Um, I've seen them since, uh, actually I went yesterday to get cereal that I ran out of. I actually saw the wife in the grocery store, you know, so it's, it's just a connection thing sometimes. And it's, if I can tuck my humility aside and recognize sometimes the greater impact of the moment, um, you know, like I've asked elderly people, when they're in the handicap, I've asked if I can help load their groceries. And, you know, I'd say 90% of them don't want you to help, right? But you know, they're going to pay the toll, you know, they're going to get so tired. And they're going to, you know, they get home and they're sore, or they strain their neck, just because of the, the, that feeling that we don't need help. And we, um, and we can do it. And, and we're right, we can, but at what cost? you know, and is it worth the cost or is it worth just saying sure and using it as an opportunity to connect and also exercise our own vulnerability because we don't do it often enough. And it's one of the hardest things ever to do. Do you think because you come from a a sporting background, it's the stubbornness, stubbornness never leaves you because ultimately that doggedness has got you to be successful in that in that arena. I I believe in the capability of change of everyone, regardless of their background. And I know for myself personally, uh, it it's the hardest thing I've ever done is asking for help, accepting help, even when I need it the most. Um, and so, yeah, I think that if you are the most capable and the most independent person when you are not capable and not independent, that must be the hardest struggle because you were way up here before and now you're way down here. And that's a big difference. So I think it's net difference. You know, I think you're right. Um, I think if I'm not as independent and I'm not as successful and I'm not as stubborn and I drop to here, it's not as big of a discrepancy. So maybe it's not um, as much of a challenge. So yeah, I I, I can get behind that hypothesis. It's it's good to see that that transition. It's, it's, I think it's for me. It's an ever ever an evolutionary process as well. Because if people were to speak to me, a few years removed from sport as as a coach, now nah, you wouldn't you you wouldn't wouldn't want to work with me one bit because I was very 
set in my ways. And it was actually a client of mine five years ago that actually brought the point to 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 view. It's like, well, I've really got an excuse today uh, because I, I have all my limbs. And I actually went the sympathetic route. It's like, well, you have an equated for not having a bad day at work, not having a good night's sleep, not having the proper nutrition. nutrition. And I went there and I've never had to use, well, and this is a sentiment I had when I, when I did get, get into the industry. But before that, it's, well, what's your excuse? You at least have all your limbs. Um, but that's very, that's very derogative to somebody that might be setting for first, their first occasion into the gym environment and has been overweight their entire life. Me having a derogative sentiment and you know a quick judgmental impression like that it won't be good they wouldn't come back because like well i I, i'm just confounding that stereotype it's like well well what's your what's your excuse you 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 just like you're just lazy um but then i i will i'm very much not i'm very i think has i've i've probably retrospectively looked back and when I did it, when it was time, I thought it was ready. Okay. I can take each person case by case. Look at their journey from a mindset perspective as well. Okay. This thing way back when has had a greater impact than you deem it to have. This is why you are in the state that you're. So some of the conversations I have on social media behind the scenes would blow your mind it's like poof, i wasn't expecting that and now i need to have a moment to myself to to actually take a breath and and uh process that and park it because that's pretty uh inflammatory stuff that you've told me and i wasn't ready for it um so i i, I it, it obviously take, it does take like no and trust with with any company but obviously that's very I've had to that soul soul church with myself and become vulnerable. And I think when I've done that, people can relate to me coming back to my point with the Under Armour and Nike issue. People put me on a pedestal because of my uh, exploits in, in, in adaptive sports. I didn't do that. I know there's a lot of like points that you brought up that are like points to speak to. I mean, motivation by essentially guilt, right? That's what we're talking about. We're saying, we get that you're not doing X, Y, Z. So the way that we can relate on our end is going, well, that's silly because you've got all your limbs. It's just, it's a, it induces a state of guilt, which for some people could result in motivation. It, um, but for a lot of others, it might create barriers or sense of obligation. Like, so they act because of obligation rather than acting because of true passion, which I think is at best a very short window of change or, and then it's back to the normal way of thinking. But I think the bigger concept of, um, you know, things being relative. So I remember back in the day when I wasn't adaptive, I had gone to college for eight years, life was easy breezy, everything was planned. Usually I'd leave the house at a certain time, I'd get to work at a certain time, I had all my routines in place. And if something challenged my schedule and my routine and was an inconvenience it was like catastrophic right you have a bad hair day and the whole rest of the day you're frustrated it sounds stupid but truly that was a concern for me as a young professional you spill coffee on your outfit on the way to work and you're going to have a coffee stain and like you're frustrated about it you're five minutes late out the door because you have a meeting and it's the end of the world right you hit traffic and you're going to be 10 minutes late and you are just angry and you may have been cut off on the way to work. And so now that's a compounded issue. And then you get to work and the vending machine is out of the protein bar that you normally get. And so now the world is against you because there's three things in a row. And so it's, you know, that was my reality. That's most people's reality in in busy everyday life. Inconveniences are obstacles that are just not welcome and we don't factor in for, and we're not flexible to, and it creates a mindset of frustration and victimization and demotivation and all these things. But in reality, 
And so now looking, so I should say, looking at it from my perspective now, like <laughs> I would trade those sets of circumstances for anything in the world, right? Um, I, like you said, you would love to be able to get out of bed every night and not have to hop to the bathroom if you could. <laughs> like that would be great to not have to do that with a heavy bladder, but that's not your reality. So you look back at some of these inconveniences that other people deal with that they think are big stressors. And in your lens or through your lenses, that is ridiculous, right? Like you're, cause your scale, your, the relativity of that issue on your scale is such a minor blip compared to the things that you've been through and the obstacles and the traumas and the challenges and the sacrifices and the hurdles that you've had to go through just to get to a state of stability where those little inconveniences could even happen. So it's like, you just can't even fathom it on your scale now. But if you remember back to before you were 15 or before I was diagnosed, that was a big deal because your scales are different. Your, your experiences shape your perspective and your perspective is what narrates your mindset toward life. So I realized shortly after becoming an amputee and having similar frustration, like I had a lot of frustrations with people in my life that were loved ones even that would, they were just focused on the wrong things. You know, for instance, my brother came to live with me. My marriage had dissolved at the same time as his marriage was dissolving. It was actually beautifully serendipitous. And he moved in with me in the year that I was recovering. And it was like the best relationship building time. But, you know, he was working and I was on disability and, um, you know, I was pretty laid up, uh, had a lot of complications and he was very sweet right before he'd go to work. He'd come upstairs and he'd put some coffee next to my bed and he'd give me a kiss on the forehead and he'd run out. And oftentimes he'd leave in this frenzy of stress because he was always a few minutes late. It's like part of our life is Godfrey's. That's my maiden name. We were, we're like chronically five minutes behind. And so he would just get, he would come over and he'd have this energy of just like stress because, you know, it was late again. And he'd go to leave the door, you know, and I would call him from bed, you know, atrophied and cachectic and just sad and, to, you know, disabled, like all these things that visually were a stimulus for him. And I'd go, hey, Rick, as he goes to leave the door and I go, you know, a lot of people would kill to be able to run out the door on two legs five minutes late to work. So maybe that should be your focus. You're pretty lucky. And it, I mean, you could just see like the total tone change in his body because it was gratitude. It was gratitude based on perspective that in those moments people don't have because they don't have the same experiences as you. So I had to learn like rather than be frustrated by their seeming ignorance, truly, I have to be understanding of the fact that to them, their stressors and their challenges and their excuses and their whatevers are very real because that is what their life is and what their experiences are. It doesn't make them any less or more than mine. They're just different. And I only hope that they go through some real struggle in life to develop a warrior within them to recognize that those are not really hard problems and those are not really valid excuses but me forcing my opinion down their throat is going to do nothing but create resentment and barrier to their learning. So, you know, kindness first and use it as a teaching opportunity and hope that at some point that seed that you planted is watered at some point, you know? I get your point. I know we could talk for hours, you and I, um, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, too much more of your time. And I will move next to my penultimate question that I like to have ask every guest is if you had to sit with, down with any athlete dead or alive, who would that be and why? Hmm. Man. That's a really tough question because You know, I'd probably, and I don't even know their name. I would probably want to sit with like the first person with a disability to make a mainstream sport. I don't know who that is. I need to research that right now because I would love to know where, like from an objective perspective, how far we truly have come in the sporting society from where we started and what that timeline's like and what we've really been able to do in that timeline to be able to gauge like the future. Um, 
because we have all these, like we have our own anecdotal information from just being athletes for the last couple decades and watching things transpire. And as we, we talked about corporations adopt some adaptive images and advertisements and, and marketing and um, now having Paralympics and Olympics, you know, and, and having these platforms like Spartan for the first time, you know, two years ago, creating their first ever paid division for just para athletes. And, you know, all these things that are emerging that are evidence that there has been progression of this, um, this movement, if you will, but where did it start truly? And, and how was it for that person to, to pioneer um, this trail? And uh, what were the themes of challenge that they dealt with on a day-to-day, day-to-day basis? And are we still struggling with that every day? Like, have we really made progress in the ways that matter? Um, have we maximized our capacity for change? Or are we stagnant in some ways? And I think in order to find that out, you have to know where you started and compare that to where you are now. Um, so I would, yeah, I don't know who that person is, and but I would love to talk with that person. And my final question before we wrap up the episode, if you had to summarize what we've been speaking about into, into ugh, I'll have to restart again. If you had to summarize what we've been speaking about into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? Talk about sports and the mindset behind being adaptive and um, the room for improvement that's needed in the world uh, in approaching folks that are different and the opportunities we as a society and individually have for change. So once again, Tina, thanks again for coming on the Mindset Athlete Podcast. Thank you for having me. It was great talking to you. Oh, it's been my absolute pleasure. If you like this episode, please do share it with your friends and do let Tina and I know what you thought of the episode by tagging us over on Instagram at Tina H214. That's T I N A capital H, the number two, the number one, and the number four. And at the usual address for myself, at James O Roberts 11, and I'll spell that out again. That's J-A-M-E-S, the letter O-R-O-B-E-R-T-S, and the number 11. And again, you can do the same on Twitter and Facebook for myself. But also you can find Tina over on Facebook at Tina Godfrey Hurley. So that's Tina, T-I-N-A, Godfrey is spelled G-O-D-F-R-E-Y, and Hurley. H-U-R-L-E-Y, as well as also her non-for-profit charity, Less Leg, More Heart, which you can find over on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and not forgetting YouTube, all of which, all the links will be available in the show notes. And in addition, if you had any follow-up questions don't hesitate to shoot them over as well and finally don't forget to check out the website for the non-profit less leg more heart at www.lesslegmoreheart.com so that's www.lesslegmoreheart.com And as usual, don't forget to check out my free content at fitamputee.co.uk and click on the tab resources. But not forgetting, I've also started a new Facebook group, especially for the podcast, which you can find over on Facebook by typing in The Mindset Athlete. And last and not least and not forgetting, I've also rebranded my other Facebook group to AIM 24-7 Fat Burning Support Group. So come and check out the AIM Tribe. The links will be in the description. You can find all the show notes at mindsetgame.lipsyn.com under the category general. So once again, thanks for listening and I'll catch you next week for
for another episode of the Mindset Athlete Podcast.